talk tonight about staying connected to your true identity. I know we hear a lot about identity in this place, um, and there's a reason for it. It's vitally important. Our true identity in Christ Jesus is everything. Without your true identity, you're nothing. Um, without your true identity in Christ, you're going to fall back to the old man. You're going to fall back to the old ways. And these days, man, I don't know about you, but I can beyond measure sense an uprising of demonic activity and antagonism everywhere I go. Um, the enemy is on an uproar. He knows his time is short. He knows the time is running out for him. And he is on the move to stir up, to shake up, and to bring down as many people as he can. And if you do not know who you are, you're going to fall victim to his plan and his scheme to bring you out of position and cause you to fall. And that is not what any of us in this room want. Amen? Amen. I know I don't want it. I know I'm not going for it. I know the devil's a liar, and I know he can't have me. I know he can't have my kids. I know he can't have my wife. And as much prayer and warfare as I put in, I'm claiming everyone here in this room too. Amen? And that's how we need to be standing in the gap for each other. We're here as a unit of warfare, not only for us, but for those that are out there that are lost. But we are a tight-knit unit. We're a family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we need to be warfaring our butts off for each other. Amen? All the antagonizing and foolish nonsense and poking and provoking and causing problems and talking smack and shenanigans has got to go out the door, man. We're here together. We're a team. We're a unit. You're out there in the military. I've never served in the military, but I know a lot about it. I have family members that have served. Those people that are with you out there, you have to be able to rely on them. They are the difference between your life and your death. If you can't rely on the man next to you, you got a problem. And I know there's people in here that have served. They know all about it. They know the reality of it. They know the truth of it. And that is exactly how it is here in this place. We got to stop messing around and start getting serious about what's going on in this world. Each one of us has a position to fill, and we got to start filling it. Amen? Um, I want to go to 1 Peter 1, 3 through 10. Something that the Lord rebuked me about this week was, and I've been dealing with this nonsense going on with my throat for like three weeks, and I, you know, fell into this place of, grumbling, complaining about my situation and my throat and all this nonsense. And again, don't look at me like y'all have never grumbled and complained, all right? I don't condone it. Believe me when I tell you, I had to turn and repent and, you know, ask the Lord to forgive me. But I'm driving down the road and I'm grumbling about my throat. And um, shortly after that, I get rebuked by the Lord. And as I'm riding, um, the Lord put it on my heart to pray for young children that have been kidnapped, that are, that are used for sex trafficking, that are used for slavery, um, that are used for satanic ritualistic abuse. And so as I'm praying, I'm getting convicted because here I am complaining about my stinking throat and there's children that are out there that are being trafficked, being sexually abused, um, being used and, and tossed aside. You know, and that's, that's the call on our life. That's our identity is to be standing in the gap and warfaring for these individuals, not complaining about what this person did or what that person did or what I'm dealing with or what I'm going through. You know what I'm saying? We have a higher call, and we need to start seeing it through and paying attention to it. That is our identity. That is who we are. We are called to warfare for the lost, to bring rescue to the lost, to comfort the brokenhearted, to pick each other up when we fall down, and to be there for one another. And that's something that we've got to start practicing. It takes practice. We weren't born with that mindset, with that nature, to just want to help everybody out and try and rescue as many people as possible. We have to be taught that, and we have to practice that. We have to learn that. And it takes a lot of work. Amen? All right, so let's go to First Peter.
First Peter chapter three. I'm sorry, chapter one, verses three through ten. Hallelujah. Let's read it. And it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance. Everybody say inheritance. Everybody say, I have a heavenly inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Anybody in here been grieved by any various trials? I'm here to tell you right now that the inheritance from the Lord is worth the various trials. Amen? How many of you suffered beyond measure when you were out there in the world? How many of you think that it was a worse suffering than anything you have to deal with now that you know Jesus? There's nothing that compares to knowing Jesus. So anything you go through now, you know, is nowhere near as bad as it was when you were out there in the world. Amen. The inheritance that we want to maintain and we want to keep intact with is our heavenly inheritance. We need to sever the worldly inheritance. The things of the world, money, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. Hallelujah. So, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Hallelujah. We are beyond blessed. Um, and we need to get to a place where we stop grumbling, complaining about how bad we think we have it. And recognize that we have got it made. We have far and above everything that we could ever hope for or ask for. Um, so when it comes to this heavenly inheritance, all right, so we know that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. We are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. But do you truly know that? Do you truly believe it? Do you truly receive and, and see what God actually has for you? You know, there's an area where we hear about a lot of this stuff all the time, but I think that a lot of times we don't truly grab a hold and visualize, you know, what God is actually saying when we have a heavenly inheritance and what we receive in that heavenly inheritance. And, you know, for the carnal mind, the only thing that we ever see is usually finances and cars and vehicles and clothes and family and houses and all that stuff. But there is something much greater that we're storing up in the heavenlies. Um, and it's not to say that you're not going to have finances here, homes or whatever here, but what we are storing up in heavenly places far outweighs what we're trying to do here on earth with finances and everything. Our heavenly inheritance, when we get home, we'll know how many people that we helped set free, how many souls that we helped to deliver. That is our call, our purpose, our destiny while we're here, and that's what we need to be maintaining. Let's go to Genesis 25:29. You know, we talk a lot about money and finances in the world and, you know, things that people chase to throw them out of position. Um, there's an area where we need to see the value in each other's lives. We need to see the value in how much a soul is worth. We need to see the value in how much your brother's worth. And that needs to be what we're focused on. You know, a lot of people are focused on, I want to hurry up and get back to my family. I want to hurry up and get a job. I want to hurry up and get a car. I want to hurry up and get my driver's license. I want to do this. I want to do that. What we need to be focused on is warfare and prayer and seeking a relationship with the Lord so that we can be who we need to be for everybody else. 
and God will add everything to you that you need. Amen. It says, now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with, with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I am about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. It's, it's a sad deal, you know, to see people come, come in, they get set free, they start working hard, they start sowing in the spirit, they start getting freed up, start having revival in their family and everything like that. And somewhere along the way, they sell their true heavenly birthright. Each one of us has been given an amazing inheritance, an amazing birthright from the Lord. You know, and I see, when I read this and I see it, I look at it like that bowl of stew, even though it's, you know, a carnal deal or it's like a piece of food or whatever. What I see with that is all the temptation, all the trickery, all the lies of the enemy that he, he comes in and tries to show each and every one of us each day to try and steer us out of position. You know, one of the things that, you know, we talked about money. Um, one of the biggest things that the enemy tried to come to me with was a financial blessing. Um, you know, for me, I can only talk from my experience, but for me, I knew early on when I was here that this was the house of God that I was to be a part of. You know, God said directly, this is where you're called to. This is where you're supposed to serve. So hearing that and knowing that what the Lord speaks is law, what the Lord speaks is truth, what the Lord speaks is what he wants, that's what he commands. Um, I knew in my spirit, soul, and body that anything else that was said other than that was from the enemy. So there was always stuff, man, jobs, um, finances, homes, all kinds of stuff just pops up out of the blue. And it takes me far away from here. And I'm not talking about 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks, or anything like that. I'm talking about eighty, dollars $100,000 a year in jobs and move away and go places. Um, the thing we have to come to understand is, is what good is money and finances if we sell our soul for it? What good is money and finances if we bring a curse on ourselves for the rest of our time? What good is money and finances if 500 people that were supposed to be saved end up dying and going to hell because of the decisions that we made? Being greedy, being selfish, desiring the things of the world and what we want. God has spoken to each one of us here in this place about something. You know, he's made a promise. He's, he's given a vision. He showed you something. And um, he's not going to interrupt himself. I've had so many people come to me and tell me, like, man, God's called me to serve here. I know it. I know it. I know it. I know they call, I've, I've been called to serve here. This is the house that God has chosen for me three months later. Like, yeah, I think I'm going to go over here. I think I'm going to go do this. This happened, that happened. I'm going over here to go do this. Doesn't work out well for him nine times out of ten, man. We need to recognize that our inheritance is not about money. It's not about worldly, and worldly possessions. It's about saving souls. And that starts with our soul. Because you can't give what you don't have. If your soul isn't saved, your soul isn't delivered, your soul isn't rescued, you can't help anybody else. There's a, a place where, you know, when I was coming through the program, whatever, and, and I started getting delivered and started getting healed and started really getting touched by the Lord, I had this phenomenal vision, like, of the cul-de-sac. You know, everybody thinks about this cul-de-sac, and they call it all kinds of stuff, whatever. So I'm, I'm in my prayer closet, and I just see the cul-de-sac. I see the cul-de-sac. I can see the stop sign down at the end of the street. I can see Mom Kate Pastor's house down there. And, and all of a sudden, it was like it just, in the spirit, I could see like heavenly gates right at the end of the street by the stop sign. 
and I could see angels all around the campus. And the Lord revealed to me that this was a, a heavenly compound that was divinely appointed by the throne room of God to rescue, to deliver, to train up, and to send out. And from that day on, I have known without a doubt in my spirit, soul, and body that that is who I am. That is my identity in Christ. I was rescued to rescue. And, you know, we all hear about, we hear about this stuff all the time, you know. Um, but I started really looking at it and kind of seeing, like, where did, where did this start for me? Like, where did this start? Um, where did I start to really actually realize and visualize and see you know, who I truly was in Christ Jesus, who I truly was um, in the spirit, you know, because my whole life I was told I was this and I was that. And then growing up with my friends, I became what the world wanted me to become. And I had my worldly identity. And so there was a identity crisis struggle when I came through here because everything you've learned your whole entire life, you find out it's a complete and utter lie. And it was all designed to kill you, lock you up for the rest of your life, or cause you to do harm on everybody that's around you. And when I finally realized that I was lied to my whole life, I was like, man, Lord, what in the world do I do now? I don't even know who the heck I am. Where do we go from here? Um, and the answer is Jesus. That's where you go from there. You seek him, you get with him, and you let him lead you and guide you into who you truly are. Let's go to Psalm 73, 1. No, I know things get, they get rough. You know, they get tough. You got demonic activity all around. You got stuff trying to antagonize you, things you're dealing with within yourself, things you're trying to get rid of, things that, of the old that are coming back. You're battling because your, heart, your heart's desire is to do the right thing. Your heart's desire is to be righteous, to be holy, to be sanctified, to be pure in the Lord's eyes. But you're still battling this old garbage, you know, and it still comes back, and it tries to bring condemnation when you make a mistake or when you fall. And then things of the world start looking good to you, and you start desiring things that you shouldn't be desiring. And you see other people growing. You see other people gaining stuff. And you wish, man, I wish that was me, and I want it now. I want it now. I want it now. we got to come to a place where we don't want anything now but Jesus. All we need right now is Jesus. That's it. Everything else he'll bring to you in due time. What he has for him over here is not the same that he has for you. What he has for him is not the same that he has for me. We've got to keep our eyes on us and him and what he's doing with us. Amen. So Psalm 73, starting at verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than, they have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? The enemy will use anything and anyone at any time to steal your inheritance, your true identity. We must learn let me see here. We must learn to live in the truth and allow nothing to sway us from the truth. So, you know, in this whole thing that we got interrupted in, um, don't allow what you see with your eyes from individuals in the world, money, wealth, cars, clothes, all that stuff. It seems like they're not struggling, but they're struggling. Believe me when I tell you they're struggling. Set your eyes on the Lord, set your eyes on the things of the Lord, and he'll bring all that stuff to you.
the only way to receive our inheritance and walk in our true identity is to have a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with Jesus where there is where we know that there is nothing where we can do nothing and we are nothing without him when Jesus touches your heart you will never go back you know it's it's kind of hard man you know we talked about see a lot of people come through here see a lot of people start getting touched healed they go through deliverance they go through the healing process they do all that stuff and they still fall off you know they still fall out they still fall out of order a lot of them have died a lot of them are in prison um, a lot of them are back out there using um, and I truly believe a lot of it had to do with and, and most of it had to do with not having ever experienced a true heart-to-heart -heart connection with the father um, and you know that's to me is the basis of what this entire teaching is about our true identity comes from having that heart-to-heart -heart relationship with the Lord you know truly having your heart touched by God it's not something that I can give you it's not something that pastor can give you it's not something that your brother or sister can give you it's something that you have to get in a specific meeting place with the Lord and allow him to visit you allow him to touch you allow him to be with you you know, and without that time, without spending that time getting to know him, without spending that time of getting to a place where you're vulnerable with him and you, you know that you're worthy of his touch, you'll never have it. You'll go through the motions, you'll go through the process, you'll do the warfare prayers, you'll go through deliverance, and you'll go through all this stuff, but never truly get set free. Because it's not just the process of this place that sets you free, it's the power of the Holy Ghost and Jesus touching your heart. Without a touch from the Lord, you can do all the motions you want. You're not going to get free. If you don't truly go after the Lord with everything you have, you will never be completely free. You may look free. You may act free. You may go through the motions. And we've seen plenty of people going through the motions. They look like they're doing good. and They look like they're doing great. They're volunteering, their rear ends off, they're doing all kinds of stuff. And man, they're doing all kinds of nonsense in darkness. You truly get touched in the heart by Jesus, you will turn your ways and you will never go back. Psalm 63. We know that we have an inheritance from the throne room of God. We know that we have a call, purpose, and destiny to fulfill, to get our soul set free, to get touched, changed, healed, delivered, to stay in position, to be obedient, to fight the good fight of faith and bring rescue to those that are out there. The only way you're ever going to be able to do that is having that divine connection with Jesus. Amen. Everything goes back to Jesus. You can do all the stuff you want to do. But until you have that divine connection with Jesus, it's not going to happen. You know, we used to go into the war room when I was in the discipleship house. And when I was in the yellow house as well, managing the yellow house. Um, there was a lot of us, man. We were hungry and thirsty for the Lord. You know, that, that was what we wanted. We wanted Jesus, and that's what we wanted. Um, and there was so many different times when... Me and a handful of other people would get with pastor and be like, hey, man, Saturday night, we want to go to the war room and worship, you know. And we would take the free time that we were given, and we'd go worship in the war room for like two hours, man. I mean, when you're in this house, when you're in the house, you know, this is mostly for total freedom individuals who are in the houses right now. It's for everybody, but especially for you, you're there to find Jesus. That's what you're there for. You're there to find the Lord. You're there to find out who you truly are. You're there to spend time with him. You're there to get to know him. And you're there to let him get to know you more. Don't take your time for granted while you're in those houses. Seek him with everything you have. Because I'm telling you right now, if you don't do it in that house, you're not going to do it when you get out of that house. It's not going to happen. We were in that war room worshiping, and it was probably the first time that I had ever I had been touched many times before, but this was like divine beyond measure. You know, and we hear about for pastor, you know, when he changed how he had his visitation from the Lord and he was just 
And that was it for him. He was changed. He knew God was real. He had that divine touch from Jesus directly in his heart, and it was, that was it. He was sold out. Um, and we, we were worshiping, and I remember crying out to the Lord just saying, Lord, I don't even know what love is. Show me your love. And the most real spiritual experience I ever had, I could feel pressure on my heart. And as much as it hurt, it brought the biggest amount of peace and freedom and healing and blessing. And he said, this is only a touch of it. You can't even handle how much I love you. You can't handle how much it is, my love for you. And it, I mean, I was crying my eyes out. It was the first time in my life that I knew that I was loved. Some of us have never experienced just pure love, to know what pure love is. It's there for each and every one of us, man. There is a meeting place for each and every person here in this room that he wants to meet you just like that. He wants to put his hand inside you, grab a hold of your heart, and show you how much he has for you, how much love he has for you. Don't let that time slip away. Get with him. Spend that time with him. That's what's going to cause you to know who you are. You will never lose sight of who you are once you have that touch from the throne room. Psalm 63. All right. This is our heart's cry. This is what our heart's cry needs to be. Amen. Oh, God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me, but those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals, but the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory, but the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. This must be our heart's cry. Jesus must be our heart's cry. Isaiah 26, 8 through 9. Yes, in the way of your judgments, O oh Lord, we have waited for you. The desire of our soul is for your name and for the remembrance of you. With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So as you seek him, as you glorify him, as he begins to touch you, you begin to touch others. Amen. Psalms 101.1. You know, something you'll notice when you truly go after him with everything you have and you truly have that heart-to-heart -heart relationship with Jesus, you'll begin to see things that you never could believe possible. The dreams, the visions, the amount of stuff you'll see as you're just driving down the road will blow your mind. You'll drive around and you'll have people blaring accursed witchcraft music and you'll see angels over your vehicle with swords blocking and defending and destroying powers of darkness trying to enter you through that music. It will not touch you. You'll drive around and you'll see stuff like sprinklers going off, just water in the lawn. And you'll visualize and see yourself twisting around like a sprinkler and the water coming out of your mouth is words of life bringing rescue and destruction on the kingdom of Satan. I'm telling you, you start seeing things that will blow your mind. You'll see every word coming out of your mouth being a sword cutting the heads off of demons. You will visually see 
spirits being destroyed. Angels all around you. Angels all around your family. Angels all around the campus. Angels going out and making war in heavenlies. This is who we are. These are the things we need to believe. These are the things we need to see. When you're truly seeking the Lord with all your heart, you will become to see the unseen more than you see the natural. And that's something we need to constantly be praying. Father, show me the unseen more than I see the natural stuff. Amen. That sprinkler one was kind of goofy, I'll tell you that right now. I'm telling you, I was riding down the road one day, man, and it blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. And me and this kid, Angel, were doing stuff for the ministry, and we're riding down the road, and I'm looking out the window, and I see this sprinkler just watering the grass. And all of a sudden, I start seeing just out there in the open. I was in the passenger seat. I wasn't driving, so we were all safe. And I just start seeing me, like, spinning around. And it wasn't like some sissy sprinkler just spinning around spraying water. It was like a warrior, you know, spinning around with my head up, just spraying out, spraying out water. But it wasn't water. It was like warfare, like bombs. It was destruction on the enemy. It was rescue to children that had been taken captive. It was rescue to people all over the world. And that's, that's truly what we do. You know, what you guys do every morning in your living rooms when you're gathered together praying that's not just because you're told to go out there and pray. There's a reason for that. Those words you're speaking are bringing rescue to children, to people that are out there that are, that are going through things. And that's something that you need to take serious. You know, I mean, it, a lot of times people get to a place where like, man, I got to get up again at 530, be on the living room. You start to take it for granted and forget where you came from. You need to remember that you're there to warfare and destroy the enemy for other people out there that were in the same situation you were in not too long ago. Amen? All right, so let's read this. Psalms 101, starting at verse 1. I will sing of mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. We are called to battle daily, but until we have a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with our Father, we will never truly understand warfare. And it wasn't until I had a heart-to-heart -heart touch from the Lord, a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with the Lord, that I truly understood warfare. You know, this thing here. Being a priest, so fulfilling our priesthood, being a priest and a true minister to the Lord will cause you to become a warrior. Everywhere you go, you will see in the spirit targets that need to be destroyed and people that need to be rescued. And we're going to close at Matthew 12. You know, when you come in, they tell you you need to do all these prayers and pray all these prayers and keep doing all these prayers and keep doing all these prayers. When I got here, I had no idea about anything I was doing. I had no idea why. I didn't understand it. I thought it was crazy, but I did it. And through my obedience and doing it, brought reward. So do not take for granted. Do not take lightly all the prayers that you're given to do, the things that you're supposed to be doing. Do them and do them well. Do them and know that you're doing them for a purpose. And even if you don't understand it, through your obedience, God will reward you. He will reward you, and he will touch you, he will change you, he will heal you, and you'll begin to understand what you're doing. You'll begin to see it in the spirit, the things that you're doing, the people that you're rescuing, the children that you're taking out of captivity that have been suffering. You'll begin to see those things. I don't know about you guys, but I love seeing stuff like that, man. I love 
having a visitation from the Lord and getting a revelation and seeing a little girl rescued from something or seeing demons' heads cut off or seeing bombs going off in places, destroying powers of darkness and plots and schemes of the enemy. I love it, man. I can't live without it. I can't, I can't go on without it. And I know that if I don't maintain my connection with Jesus, I won't see those things. I won't know what's happening in the spirit. I won't be able to see the places that need to be attacked before they attack me or before they attack you or before they attack somebody else. I won't be in tune with the spirit. So you've got to maintain your divine connection with Jesus through worship, through warfare, through prayer, and through just spending time with him. Get in a secret place and get quiet with him. Talk to him. Minister to him. Bless him. Touch him. And he will show up and show out in your life. It's a guarantee. Matthew 12. 43 through 45. Hallelujah. So I know we all came from a rough past. I know I don't want to go back to my past, and I know I'm never going back to my past. Um, and just kind of a reminder and a remembrance of where you came from. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they in turn dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Hallelujah. So never forget where you came from. Never forget what you've been rescued from. I know I was bad enough as it was out there. I could only imagine times eight. Don't go there. Amen. Know what you've been saved from. Know what you've been rescued from. Fight the good fight. Get in touch with your father. If you've lost sight of it, if you've fallen off of it, if you start, have been growing weary, been getting stressed, um, been dealing with things, been thinking about other things, step back, repent, and just get in a secret, quiet place with him. And allow him to minister to you. Amen? Hallelujah. Father, we love you and bless you, Lord. And we give you all glory, honor, and praise. We thank you for your word tonight. We know that the enemy is trembling. We know that the enemy is scared of us because we know who we are. We know that we call down fire in locations and we destroy the powers of darkness through your anointing, through your, through your power, Lord. So we just receive it, Lord. We believe it. We walk in it. We decree it. And we thank you that you shared it with us, Lord. Even when we're idiots, you continue to bless us and keep us safe and protected. And we love you and we bless you in Jesus' name.